Apple Talk is a discontinued proprietary suite of networking protocols developed by Apple Inc. for their Macintosh computers. Apple Talk includes a number of features that allow local area networks to be connected with no prior setup or the need for a centralized router or server of any sort. Connected Apple Talk equipped systems automatically assign addresses, update the distributed namespace, and configure any required internetworking routing. Apple Talk was released in 1985 and was the primary protocol used by Apple devices through the 1980s and 1990s. Versions were also released for the IBM PC and compatibles in the Apple Leagues. Apple Talk support was also available in most networked printers, some file servers, and a number of routers. The rise of TCP IP during the 1990s led to a re-implementation of most of these types of support on that protocol, and Apple Talk became unsupported as of the release of Mac OS X v10. 6 in 2009. Many of Apple Talk's more advanced auto configuration features have since been introduced in Bonjour, while Universal Plug and Play serves similar needs. After the release of the Apple Lisa computer in January 1983, Apple invested considerable effort in the development of a local area networking system for the machines. Known as AppleNet, it was based on the seminal Xerox XNS protocol stack but running on a custom 1 megabit per second coaxial cable system rather than Xerox's 2. 94 megabits per second Ethernet. AppleNet was announced early in 1983 with a full introduction at the target price of $500 for plug in AppleNet cards for the Lisa and the Apple II. At that time, early LAN systems were just coming to market, including Ethernet, Token Ring, Econet, and ArcNet. This was a topic of major commercial effort at the time, dominating shows like the National Computer Conference in Anaheim in May 1983. All of the systems were jockeying for position in the market, but even at this time Ethernet's widespread acceptance suggested it was to become a de facto standard. It was at this show that Steve Jobs asked Ger Sharon C. to a seemingly innocuous question, why has networking not caught on? Four months later, in October, AppleNet was cancelled. At the time, they announced that Apple realized that it's not in the business to create a networking system. We built and used AppleNet in-house, but we realized that if we had shipped it, we would have seen new standards coming up. In January, Jobs announced that they would instead be supporting IBM's token ring, which he expected to come out in a few months. Through this period, Apple was deep in development of the Macintosh computer. During development, engineers had made the decision to use the Zilog 8530 serial controller chip instead of the lower cost and more common UART to provide serial port connections. The SCC cost about $5 more than a UART, but offered much higher speeds of up to 250 kilobits per second and internally supported a number of basic networking like protocols like IBM's BiSync. The SCC was chosen because it would allow multiple devices to be attached to the port. Peripherals equipped with similar SCCs could communicate using the built-in protocols, interleaving their data with other peripherals on the same bus. This would eliminate the need for more ports on the back of the machine, and allowed for the elimination of expansion slots for supporting more complex devices. The initial concept was known as Apple Bus, envisioning a system controlled by the host Macintosh pulling dumb devices in a fashion similar to the modern Universal Serial Bus. The Macintosh team had already begun work on what would become the laser writer, and had considered a number of other options to answer the question of how to share these expensive machines and other resources. A series of memos from Bob Belvo clarified these concepts, outlining the Mac, laser writer and a file server system which would become the Macintosh office. By late 1983 it was clear that IBM's token ring would not be ready in time for the launch of the Mac, and might miss the launch of these other products as well. In the end, token ring would not ship until October 1985. Jobs' earlier question to C2 had already sparked a number of ideas. When AppleNet was cancelled in October, C2 led an effort to develop a new networking system based on the Apple Bus hardware. This new system would not have to conform to any existing preconceptions, and was designed to be worthy of the Mac, a system that was user-installable, had zero configuration, and no fixed network addresses, in short, a true plug-and-play network. Considerable effort was needed, but by the time the Mac was released, the basic concepts had been outlined, and some of the low-level protocols were on their way to completion. Sidu mentioned the work to Belleville only two hours after the Mac was announced. The new Apple bus was announced in early 1984, 
allowing direct connection from the Mac or Lisa through a small box that plugged into the serial port and connected via cables to the next computer upstream and downstream. Adapters for Apple II and Apple III were also announced. Apple also announced that Apple Bus networks could be attached to, and would appear to be a single node within, a token ring system. Details of how this would work were sketchy. Just prior to its release in early 1985, Apple Bus was renamed Apple Talk. Initially marketed as Apple Talk Personal Network, it comprised a family of network protocols and a physical layer. The physical layer had a number of limitations, including a speed of only 230. 4 kilobits per second, a maximum distance of 1,000 feet from end to end, and only 32 nodes per LAN. But as the basic hardware was built into the Mac, adding nodes only cost about $50 for the adapter box. In comparison, Ethernet or token ring cards cost hundreds or thousands of dollars. Additionally, the entire networking stack required only about 6 kilobytes of RAM, allowing it to run on any Mac. The relatively slow speed of Apple Talk allowed further reductions in cost. Instead of using RS-422's balance transmit and receive circuits, the Apple Talk cabling used a single common electrical ground, which limited speeds to about 500 kilobits per second, but allowed one conductor to be removed. This meant that common three conductor cables could be used for wiring. Additionally, the adapters were designed to be self-terminating, meaning that nodes at the end of the network could simply leave their last connector unconnected. There was no need for the wires to be connected back together into a loop, nor the need for hubs or other devices. The system was designed for future expansion, the addressing system allowed for expansion to 255 nodes in a LAN. And by using bridges one could interconnect LANs into larger collections. Zones allowed devices to be addressed within a bridge-connected internet. Additionally, Apple Talk was designed from the start to allow use with any potential underlying physical link, and within a few years, the physical layer would be renamed Local Talk, so as to differentiate it from the Apple Talk protocols. The main advantage of Apple Talk was that it was completely maintenance free. To join a device to a network, a user simply plugged the adapter into the machine, then connected a cable from it to any free port on any other adapter. The Apple Talk network stack negotiated a network address, assigned the computer a human readable name, and compiled a list of the names and types of other machines on the network so the user could browse the devices through the chooser. Apple Talk was so easy to use that ad hoc networks tended to appear whenever multiple Macs were in the same room. Apple would later use this in an advertisement showing a network being created between two seats in an airplane. A thriving third party market for Apple Talk devices developed over the next few years. One particularly notable example was an alternate adapter designed by Mug and commercialized by Farrell on his phone net in 1987. This was essentially a replacement for Apple's connector that had conventional phone jacks instead of Apple's round connectors. PhoneNet allowed AppleTalk networks to be connected together using normal telephone wires, and with very little extra work, could run analog phones and AppleTalk on a single four-conductor phone cable. Other companies took advantage of the SCC's ability to read external clocks in order to support higher transmission speeds, up to 1 megabit per second. In these systems the external adapter also included its own clock and used that to signal the SCC's clock input pins. The best known such system was Centram's Flash Talk, which ran at 768 kilobits per second, and was intended to be used with their TOPS networking system. A similar solution was the 850 kilobits per second Dana Talk, which used a separate box that plugged in between the computer and a normal local talk slash phone net box. Dana also offered a PC expansion card that ran up to 1. 7 megabits per second when talking to other Dana PC cards. Several other systems also existed with even higher performance, but these often required special cabling that was incompatible with local talk slash phone net, and also required patches to the networking stack that often caused problems. As Apple expanded into more commercial and education markets, they needed to integrate Apple Talk into existing network installations. Many of these organizations had already invested in a very expensive Ethernet infrastructure and there was no direct way to connect a Macintosh to Ethernet. Apple Talk included a protocol structure for interconnecting Apple Talk subnets and so as a solution, EtherTalk was initially created to use the Ethernet as a backbone between local talk subnets. To accomplish this, organizations would need to purchase a local talk to Ethernet bridge and Apple left it to third parties to produce these products. A number of companies responded, including Hayes and a few newly formed companies like Kinetics. 
By 1987, Ethernet was clearly winning the standards battle over Token Ring, and in the middle of that year Apple introduced EtherTalk 1.0, an implementation of the AppleTalk protocol over the Ethernet physical layer. Introduced for the newly released Macintosh 2 computer, Apple's first Macintosh with expansion slots, the operating system included a new network control panel that allowed the user to select which physical connection to use for networking. At introduction, Ethernet interface cards were available from 3Com and Kinetics that plugged into a Nuba slot in the machine. The new networking stack also expanded the system to allow a full 255 nodes per LAN. With EtherTalk's release, AppleTalk Personal Network was renamed Local Talk, the name it would be known under for the bulk of its life. Token Ring would later be supported with a similar Token Talk product, which used the same network control panel and underlying software. Over time, many third-party companies would introduce compatible Ethernet and Token Ring cards that used these same drivers. The appearance of a Macintosh with a direct Ethernet connection also magnified the Ethernet and local talk compatibility problem, networks with new and old Macs needed some way to communicate with each other. This could be as simple as a network of Ethernet Mac 2s trying to talk to a laser writer that only connected to local talk. Apple initially relied on the aforementioned local talk to Ethernet bridge products, but contrary to Apple's belief that these would be low-volume products, by the end of 1987, 130,000 such networks were in use. Apple Talk was at that time the most used networking system in the world, with over three times the installations of any other vendor. 1987 also marked the introduction of the Apple Share product, a dedicated file server that ran on any Mac with 512 kilobytes of RAM or more. A common Apple Share machine was the Mac Plus with an external SCSI hard drive. Apple Share was the number three network operating system in the late 1980s, behind Novell Netware and Microsoft's MSNet. Apple Share was effectively the replacement for the failed Macintosh office efforts, which had been based on a dedicated file server device. A significant redesign was released in 1989 as Apple Talk Phase 2. In many ways, Phase 2 can be considered an effort to make the earlier version more generic. LANs could now support more than 255 nodes, and zones were no longer associated with physical networks, but were entirely virtual constructs used simply to organize nodes. For instance, one could now make a printer's zone that would list all the printers in an organization, or one might want to place that same device in the second floor zone to indicate its physical location. Phase 2 also included changes to the underlying internet working protocols to make them less chatty, which had previously been a serious problem on networks that bridged over wide area networks. By this point Apple had a wide variety of communications products under development, and many of these were announced along with. Apple Talk Phase 2 these included updates to EtherTalk and Token Talk, Apple Talk software, and local talk hardware for the IBM PC. EtherTalk for Apple's A/UX operating system allowing it to use laser printers and other network resources, and the Mac X.25 and Mix products. Ethernet had become almost universal by 1990, and it was time to build Ethernet into Macs direct from the factory. However, the physical wiring used by these networks was not yet completely standardized. Apple solved this problem using a single port on the back of the computer into which the user could plug an adapter for any given cabling system. This friendly net system was based on the industry standard attachment unit interface or AUI, but deliberately chose a non-standard connector that was smaller and easier to use. Which they called Apple AUI, or AUI. Friendly net was first introduced on the Quadra 700 and Quadra 900 computers, and used across much of the Mac line for some time. As with local talk, a number of third-party friendly net adapters quickly appeared. As 10 base t became the de facto cabling system for Ethernet, second-generation power Macintosh machines added a 10 base t port in addition to AUI. The PowerBook 3400C and lower-end Power Macs also added 10 base t The Power Macintosh 7300-8600-9600 were the final Macs to include AUI and 10 base t became universal starting with the Power Macintosh G3 and PowerBook G3. From the beginning of Apple Talk, users wanted to connect the Macintosh to the TCP IP network environments. In 1984, Bill Croft at Stanford University pioneered the development of IP packets encapsulated in DDP as part of the Seagate project. Seagate was commercialized by Kinetics in their local talk to Ethernet bridge as an additional routing option. A few years later, Mac IP, was separated from the Seagate code and became the de facto method for IP packets to be routed over local talk networks. By 1986, 
Columbia University released the first version of the Columbia Apple Talk package that allowed higher integration of Unix, TCP IP and Apple Talk environments. In 1988, Apple released MacCP, a system that allowed the Mac to support TCP IP on machines with suitable Ethernet hardware. However, this left many universities with the problem of supporting IP on their many local talk equipped Macs. It was soon common to include Mac IP support and local talk to Ethernet bridges. MacCP would not become a standard part of the classic Mac OS until 1994, by which time it also supported SNMP and PPP. For some time in the early 1990s, the Mac was a primary client on the rapidly expanding Internet. Among the better-known programs in wide use were Fetch, Eudora, eExodus, Newswatcher and the NCSA packages, especially NCSA Mosaic and its offspring, Netscape Navigator. Additionally, a number of server products appeared that allowed the Mac to host internet content. Through this period, Macs had about two to three times as many clients connected to the internet as any other platform, despite the relatively small overall microcomputer market share. As the world quickly moved to IP for both LAN and WAN users, Apple was faced with maintaining two increasingly outdated code bases on an ever wider group of machines as well as the introduction of the power PC-based machines. This led to the open transport efforts, which re-implemented both MacCP and AppleTalk on an entirely new code base adapted from the Unix standard streams. Early versions had problems and did not become stable for some time. By that point, Apple was deep in their ultimately doomed Copeland efforts. With the purchase of Next and subsequent development of Mac OS X, AppleTalk was strictly a legacy system. Support was added to OS X in order to provide support for the large number of existing AppleTalk devices, notably laser printers and file shares, but alternate connection solutions common in this era, notably USB for printers, limited their demand. As Apple abandoned many of these product categories, and all new systems were based on IP, AppleTalk became less and less common. AppleTalk support was finally removed from the Mac OS and Mac OS X v10. 6 in 2009. However, the loss of Apple Talk did not reduce the desire for networking solutions that combined its ease of use with IP routing. Apple has led development of many such efforts, from the introduction of the airport router to the development of the zero configuration networking system and their implementation of it. Bonjour. As of 2020, Apple Talk support has been completely removed from legacy support with Mac OS 11 Big Sur. The Apple Talk design rigorously followed the OC model of protocol layering. Unlike most of the early LAN systems, Apple Talk was not built using the archetypal Xerox XNS system. The intended target was not Ethernet, and it did not have 48 bit addresses to route. Nevertheless, many portions of the Apple Talk system have direct analogs in XNS. One key differentiation for Apple Talk was it contained two protocols aimed at making the system completely self configuring. The AppleTalk address resolution protocol allowed AppleTalk hosts to automatically generate their own network addresses, and the name binding protocol was a dynamic system for mapping network addresses to user readable names. Although systems similar to AARP existed in other systems, Banyan Vines for instance, nothing like NBP has existed until recently. Both AARP and NBP had defined ways to allow controller devices to override the default mechanisms. The concept was to allow routers to provide the information or hardwire the system to known addresses and names. On larger networks where AARP could cause problems as new nodes searched for free addresses, the addition of a router could reduce chattiness. Together AARP and NBP made AppleTalk an easy-to-use networking system. New machines were added to the network by plugging them and optionally giving them a name. The NBP lists were examined and displayed by a program known as the Chooser which would display a list of machines on the local network, divided into classes such as file servers and printers. An AppleTalk address was a 4-byte quantity. This consisted of a 2-byte network number, a 1-byte node number, and a 1-byte socket number. Of these, only the network number required any configuration, being obtained from a router. Each node dynamically chose its own node number, according to a protocol. Originally the local talk link access protocol LAP and later, for Ethernet slash EtherTalk. The AppleTalk address resolution protocol, AARP, which handled contention between different nodes accidentally choosing the same number. For socket numbers, a few well-known numbers were reserved for special purposes specific to the AppleTalk protocol itself. Apart from these, all application-level protocols were expected to use dynamically assigned socket numbers at both the client and server end. 
Because of this dynamism, users could not be expected to access services by specifying their address. Instead, all services had names which, being chosen by humans, could be expected to be meaningful to users, and also could be sufficiently long to minimize the chance of conflicts. As NBP names translated to an address, which included a socket number as well as a node number, a name in Apple Talk mapped directly to a service being provided by a machine, which was entirely separate from the name of the machine itself. Thus, services could be moved to a different machine and, so long as they kept the same service name, there was no need for users to do anything different in order to continue accessing the service. And the same machine could host any number of instances of services of the same type, without any network connection conflicts. Contrast this with A records in the DNS, in which a name translates to a machine's address, not including the port number that might be providing a service. Thus, if people are accustomed to using a particular machine name to access a particular service, their access will break when the service is moved to a different machine. This can be mitigated somewhat by insistence on using C name records indicating service rather than actual machine names to refer to the service, but there is no way of guaranteeing that users will follow such a convention. Some newer protocols, such as Kerberos and Active Directory use DNS SRV records to identify services by name, which is much closer to the AppleTalk model. AARP resolves AppleTalk addresses to link layer, usually MAC, addresses. It is functionally equivalent to AARP and obtains address resolution by a method very similar to ARP. AARP is a fairly simple system. When powered on, an AppleTalk machine broadcasts an AARP probe packet asking for a network address, intending to hear back from controllers such as routers. If no address is provided, one is picked at random from the base subnet, 0. It then broadcasts another packet saying I am selecting this address, and then waits to see if anyone else on the network complains. If another machine has that address, it will pick another address and keep trying until it finds a free one. On a network with many machines it may take several tries before a free address is found, so for performance purposes the successful address is written down in Verm and used as the default address in the future. This means that in most real-world setups where machines are added a few at a time, only one or two tries are needed before the address effectively become constant. This was a comparatively late addition to the AppleTalk protocol suite, done when it became clear that a TCP-style reliable connection-oriented transport was needed. Significant differences from TCP were that, the Apple Filing Protocol, formerly Apple Talk Filing Protocol, is the protocol for communicating with Apple Share file servers. Built on top of Apple Talk Session Protocol or the Data Stream Interface, it provides services for authenticating users. And for performing operations specific to the Macintosh HFS file system. AFP is still in use in Mac OS, even though most other Apple Talk protocols have been deprecated. ASP was an intermediate protocol built on top of ATP, which in turn was the foundation of AFP. It provided basic services for requesting responses to arbitrary commands D performing out-of-band status queries. It also allowed the server to send asynchronous attention messages to the client. DDP was the lowest level data link independent transport protocol. It provided a datagram service with no guarantees of delivery. All application level protocols, including the infrastructure protocols NBP, RTMP and ZIP, were built on top of DDP. Apple Talks DDP corresponds closely to the network layer of the open system's interconnection communication model. Namebinding Protocol was a dynamic, distributed system for managing Apple Talk names. When a service started up on a machine, it registered a name for itself as chosen by a human administrator. At this point, NBP provided a system for checking that no other machine had already registered the same name. Later, when a client wanted to access that service, it used NBP to query machines to find that service. NBP provided browsability as well as the ability to find a service with a particular name. Names were human-readable, containing spaces, upper and lowercase letters, and including support for searching. EAP is a transport layer protocol designed to test the reachability of network nodes. EAP generates packets to be sent to the network node and is identified in the type field of a packet as an EAP packet. The packet is first passed to the source DDP. After it is identified as an EAP packet, it is forwarded to the node where the packet is examined by the DDP at the destination. After the packet is identified as an EAP packet, the packet is then copied in a field and the packet is altered to create an EAP reply packet, and is then returned to the source node. PAP was the standard way of communicating with PostScript printers. 
It was built on top of ATP. When a PAP connection was opened, each end sent the other an ATP request which basically meant send me more data. The client's response to the server was to send a block of PostScript code, while the server could respond with any diagnostic messages that might be generated as a result, after which another send more data request was sent. This use of ATP provided automatic flow control. Each end could only send data to the other end if there was an outstanding ATP request to respond to. PAP also provided for out-of-band status queries, handled by separate ATP transactions. Even while it was busy servicing a print job from one client, a PAP server could continue to respond to status requests from any number of other clients. This allowed other Macintoshes on the LAN that were waiting to print to display status messages indicating that the printer was busy, and what the job was that it was busy with. RTMP was the protocol by which routers kept each other informed about the topology of the network. This was the only part of Apple Talk that required periodic unsolicited broadcasts. Every 10 seconds, each router had to send out a list of all the network numbers it knew about and how far away it thought they were. ZIP was the protocol by which Apple Talk network numbers were associated with zone names. A zone was a subdivision of the network that made sense to humans, but while a network number had to be assigned to a topologically contiguous section of the network. A zone could include several different discontiguous portions of the network. Interior of Apple Local Talk Interface Box In 1989, these boxes typically cost 90 US dollars each. The connectors feature automatic electrical termination of the local talk signal bus, insertion of a local talk bus cable depresses a normally closed switch behind the connector, disabling termination for that connector. Farallon Phone Net Adapter The initial default hardware implementation for Apple Talk was a high speed serial protocol known as Local Talk that used the Macintosh's built in RS422 ports at 230. 4 kilobits per second. Local Talk used a splitter box in the RS422 port to provide an upstream and downstream cable from a single port. The topology was a bus, cables were daisy chained from each connected machine to the next, up to the maximum of 32 permitted on any Local Talk segment. The system was slow by today's standards, but at the time the additional cost and complexity of networking on PC machines was such that it was common that Macs were the only networked personal computers in an office. Other larger computers, such as Unix or Vax workstations, would commonly be networked via Ethernet. Other physical implementations were also available. A very popular replacement for local talk was PhoneNet, a third-party solution from Farallon Computing Incorporated that also used the RS422 port and was indistinguishable from local talk as far as Apple's local talk port drivers were concerned, but ran over the two unused wires and standard four-wire phone cabling. Foreshadowing today's network hubs and switches, Farallon provided solutions for phone net to be used in star as well as bus configurations, with both passive star connections and active star with phone net. Star controller hub hardware. Apple's local talk connectors didn't have a locking feature, so connectors could easily come loose, and the bus configuration resulted in any loose connector bringing down the whole network, and being hard to track down. PhoneNet RJ11 connectors, on the other hand, snapped into place, and in a star configuration any wiring issue only affected one device, and problems were easy to pinpoint. PhoneNet's low cost, flexibility, and easy troubleshooting resulted in it being the dominant choice for Mac networks into the early 1990s. Apple Talk protocols also came to run over Ethernet and token ring physical layers, labeled by Apple as EtherTalk and TokenTalk, respectively. EtherTalk gradually became the dominant implementation method for Apple Talk as Ethernet became generally popular in the PC industry throughout the 1990s. Besides Apple Talk and TCPIP, any Ethernet network could also simultaneously carry other protocols such as DECnet and IPX. When Apple Talk was first introduced, the dominant office computing platform was the PC-compatible running MS-DOS. Apple introduced the AppleTalk PC card in early 1987, allowing PCs to join AppleTalk networks and print to laser writer printers. A year later Apple Share PC was released, allowing PCs to access Apple Share file servers. The TOPS Teleconnector MS-DOS networking system over AppleTalk system enabled MS-DOS PCs to communicate over AppleTalk network. Hardware it comprised an Apple Talk interface card for the PC and a suite of networking software allowing such functions as file, drive, and printer sharing. As well as allowing the construction of a PC only Apple Talk network, it allowed communication between PCs and Macs with top software installed. 
The Mac Top software did not match the quality of Apple's own either in ease of use or in robustness and freedom from crashes. But the DOS software was relatively simple to use in DOS terms, and was robust. The BSD and Linux operating systems support Apple Talk through an open source project called NetAppTalk, which implements the complete protocol suite and allows them to both act as native file or print servers for Macintosh computers and print to local talk printers over the network. The Windows Server operating system supported Apple Talk starting with Windows NT and ending after Windows Server 2003. Miramar included Apple Talk in its PC McLean product, which was discontinued by CA in 2007. Group Logic continues to bundle its Apple Talk protocol with its Extremes IP server software for Macintosh Windows integration, which supports Windows Server 2008 and Windows Vista as well prior versions. Helio Software GmbH offers a proprietary implementation of the Apple Talk protocol stack as part of their Helios UV2 server. This is essentially a file and print server suite that runs on a whole range of different platforms. In addition, Columbia University released the Columbia Apple Talk package which implemented the protocol suite for various Unix flavors including Ultrix, Sun OS, BSD and Eryx. This package is no longer actively maintained. Thanks for watching.